Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cast Dice, the podcast that explores the great big wild world of tabletop gaming that exists today. It has been said one or two times on this podcast that we are in the middle of a gaming renaissance. There are just too many good games out there that we can spend our hobby time and our hobby dollars on. It can be overwhelming, and that is the purpose of this podcast, is to talk about the games that my guests have been playing that enjoy that they enjoy, the games that I've been playing that I've been enjoying, industry events, and, you know, just tournaments and events where people are playing these games. Now, tonight we are going to talk about a game that has been introduced in a prior episode. In fact, we actually talked to the author. Uh, but before we get there, um, before we talk about the grim, dark cyberpunk universe, dystopian universe, I want to in- introduce a man who I have uh, been enjoying the work of for literally years and who has been mentioned on this podcast many times. Uh, sometimes by one of his coworkers and sometimes by others. Uh, a man who, if you do not know his work, you absolutely need to check it out. Of course, I'm talking about Scott from Knights of Dice. Scott, welcome to Cast Dice, man. Thanks for having me on, Brad. Um, yeah. Oh, brother. Uh, I don't know where to start when sort of talking about the projects you've been involved in because you have some serious hobby. Um, let's start with the most recent stuff and see if people can work their way back. You have taken a bunch of um, the Batman miniatures games, the Suicide Squad box in particular, and you've repurposed it for Reality's Edge. Um, now, you took the Joker, the Jared Leto Joker model. And I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of that particular model, and I'm not a big fan of that Joker. Um, yeah, yeah, you, no arguments here. Yeah. yeah, and you took that, and you, with minimal converting, you repainted that and did it entirely. It, you made him look like uh, Roy from Blade Runner, uh, Rutger Hauer's character. Yeah. Yeah, I think the um, the the platinum blonde sort of paint job on there sort of did a lot of the heavy lifting for that. Oh, um, yeah, I just had that box sitting around. I was big into the Batman game for a couple of years, mm-hmm. and then sort of drifted off as you know the shiny magpie gamer thing happens. What are you talking about? Uh, Never done that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I just had that box sitting around, and I'm like, this this kind of look in theme for reality's edge which mm-hmm. is the thing that's currently you know getting my hobby juices flowing that's right now you have turned captain boomerang into a you you put vr goggles over his eyes and you you know messed around with his hands and you basically made him look like um like like a hacker wearing a vr rig uh it, it, you of course as being one of the studio guys with Knights of Dice, you've also then made your own, um, you know, cat terminals, and you've made all of this actually illuminating terrain that actually have LEDs in them and light up, so you can actually have that, like, dark, noir, neon-soaked settings to your games, and it looks bloody amazing, mate. Yeah, thank you so much. Um kind of had a bit of advantage uh, with what I do for a living with just like hobby stuff Mm -hmm. as we've got sort of, I've got all these resources at my disposal. So if Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, all of our equipment, I feel like manufacturing, you know, like I'm like, if I want a a particular thing that doesn't exist on the market, I can Mm -hmm. just make it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's, uh, it's awesome. So one of the one of the cool mechanics in uh, Reality's Edge that I really like, and um, I know the author spoke about when we had him on the show, was um, the fact that a lot of games, when you play them, and when you're playing in an urban environment, they often feel deserted. Um, you just don't have the people around that, uh, you know, an urban sprawl would you know, you would think would be there. Um, and so the, um, Joe, the author, said he sort of borrowed the mechanic from Games of Rome, um, Gangs of Rome, sorry, and um, that there are actually templates um, that represent crowds that move around the tabletop, and then there are individual sort of non-player characters that sort of wander around the board at the same time. 
that is such a cool mechanic. And Joe, of course, has been making um, and started selling sort of uh, acrylic templates that are see-through of sort of people that are sort of ash colored that move around the tabletop. So they don't necessarily distract you from the actual playing models, but they are, you know, the, the crowds are represented on the tabletop and they are something that you can interact with. There is a, um, one of the sort of character classes that you can take in the game, allow you the mask, allow you to interact with those. Um, now he's made those and they look fantastic. Now you've also made yours. Um, yep. th and from, you know, from a shipping standpoint, thank you. Um, and I'm hoping you'll sell them soon. But you have, I mean, you have a guy, you have the punk one. Um, yours look a little more uh, dystopian, I think, uh, which is very cool. Yeah, that, that was quite intentional. I sort of, it's, it was interesting to see how much you could, how much character you can convey with just a silhouette of mm -hmm. a person. Um, but yeah, that, that was quite intentional. Um, yeah, well, like initially, uh, I believe you were asking me about them and like a couple other people were like, we were going to do something similar mm -hmm. and I wasn't super keen cause I'm, you know, uh, I like to sort of keep our stuff, you know, uh, uh, original is a wrong word, but, uh, yeah, unique. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but sort of after having a talk to Joe about it and sort of like, oh, you know, we started designing a bunch of other accessories for it, mostly just so I can use them myself. And then, mm -hmm. you know, they end up on the web store, they end up on the web store, mm -hmm. which they will. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he kind of just was, was pretty uh, into the idea of us doing them ourselves because, you know, Australia's a long way away, mm -hmm. as we are all painfully aware. Yes. My wallet's also very painfully aware of that. Yes. Um, yeah. So that was it was fun and it was kind of a fun challenge again to see how much character and theme you can put in with just doing a silhouette of a, a person. Um, nice. Yeah. Now you you've started the range already um, with the cat terminals, which I mentioned before, and those fit beautifully on a forty millimeter base. I saw. Um, how? Uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun. Um, by getting too far into the game, but I'm wanting to ask you so many questions about your terrain and how they interact with this game. Um, how many cat terminals do you would you recommend that people get on the board? Is it three? Uh, there's four. I think every scenario, if I'm not mistaken, uses four cat terminals. Okay, right on. Yeah, so uh, the ones that we have on the web store are a pack of two, so yeah, two Perfect. packs and you're done. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I you've because I've seen that you've actually been playing with uh, our mutual friend Nick, and I have not had the opportunity to actually play the game yet. So why don't you talk us a little bit about um, maybe through how Reality's Edge works? It's a it's I guess you could call it a skirmish game. It is a small scale. You run a crew of what four to six models, and yeah, that's right. Um, you have a showrunner who is sort of your the leader of your your crew and you pull that from a set of you know character classes almost i know that's a role-playing term but i think it kind of matches it suits um the heavy narrative of feel for the game um so you, you get to choose from a, a bunch of classes like uh and we'll go through the list later but like a tracer who you know is a runner you have um, a drone controller street ronin um, enforcers, there's there's all kinds you can have, but you have that person sort of as your leader, um, and then they're backed by an organization, like a corporation or a, a criminal family of some variety, and that is represented um, usually holographically on the board, um, and then you have the rest of your, your um, showrunner's crew um, who they hire individually for the job. Um, am I getting this right? Yeah, that's uh, pretty much spot on. Uh, you mentioned the heavy narrative mm -hmm. thing. That's that's a perfect way to describe it. That's how I've been describing it uh, mm -hmm. when I've been trying to you know sell people on playing it or like discussing it with people that you know haven't got the book yet or something or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, it, there's a lot of depth in character creation and narrative stuff and customizing your characters. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it almost has like a feel of like halfway between an RPG and a tabletop game. It does. Like game. Yeah. yeah. And, um, that's, that's super appealing to me. Uh, I'm not a very competitive player. Mm. And, and I think for a sandbox game like this, like the more narrative that you can make it um, kind of works really well in its favor. Mm-hmm. And really gets the, the creativity going. Like Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I was talking to someone uh, yesterday, and they were saying how much they love Necromunda. They were saying they enjoyed the new Warcry game, but they like Necromunda because of the character advancement element and the campaign system. And mm -hmm. I, I was like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I, the new Necromunda does have a lot of that. And I went and I flipped through it. And as I was flipping through it, literally on top of that shelf is sitting my, my Reality's Edge book. And I just went, wow, there is so much more to this game than that game. Um, and Necromunda is known for that. Um, and this just takes that and sort of blows it up. It, it is such a narrative, um, I don't want to just say narrative driven, but I mean, it, you get, there are just so many things you can add in. Um, and because you have such a low model count, as you say, the character creation or rules is quite deep. But then on top of that, everything on the tabletop is interactive. You can have um, a console cowboy, um, one of your, like a hacker on your crew, um, you know, hack a light and have it explode or just get really bright to make it hard to shoot at somebody. I mean, you, you know, just a street light or, you know, just the, everything in the game is so interactive it's it's mind-boggling it's kind of intimidating for if you know i haven't played it yet but i'm looking at it going oh how does this work this i i don't even know where to start um so i was really keen to have you on to talk about how the game feels once you actually start playing so i guess that's my next question how does the game feel when you're playing it um how does it go so yeah the, the book i think can be a little bit impenetrable when you first pop it open because mm -hmm. there are so many options. Um, there's not really an index or as such. So right. like uh, it can get a little, you know, into the weeds pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, that is, that is something I found, you know, digging into it when I first opened it up. Agreed. Um, mm. But once you sort of got a bit of a handle on the core mechanics and what your guys can do, um, and like once you get on the table, it flows like it flows very well. Nice. So yeah, so I was a big fan of this. Is not a test. I played a lot of that one sort of a, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and got quite, you know, quite into that. And we did a bit of a campaign and stuff. And mm -hmm. obviously the core mechanics are pretty much identical. And it's a D10 um, system. It is a D10 system. So and uh, yeah, and and most of your basic roles will either go down to you know a stat test mm -hmm. which is against the 10 yeah your stat plus your dice roll as a 10 uh with you know modifiers and such uh or an opposed roll which is just you know obviously your stat and uh whatever you roll versus so like, what someone else adds their yeah, stat yeah, and what exa they roll. exactly yeah right. exactly uh so that's you know the very core of it and that's that's pretty simple and you mm. kind of get a handle on that pretty quickly um so yeah, I don't know. It flows really well. There's like because, but because it has that depth, there's kind of a lot of cool things you can do, and it sort of feels very narrative when things start happening on the table as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the trick with the hacking the lights of a building before. I didn't kept pulling that on Nick, and much to his, <laughs> you know, <laughs> his annoyance. Uh, uh, and like, and for instance, he has a tracer in his crew, which is the, the free runner mm -hmm. that he's sort of tooled up to the nines with, with Chrome that makes them move faster and stuff. And that character will be leaping over buildings and getting in my face before I want them there. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. So it feel, that narrative really does come through when you got it on the table. So it's like a, a cyborg parkour champion. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. So cool. Yeah. I, Oh, that's one of the, one, that's one of the character classes that I keep looking at going, I really need to convert one of you. That that looks super cool because it's sort of a trope that you don't see in a lot of other game systems. But yeah, and it's it's been super effective uh, in the few games that we've played, um, just because it can cover ground so much. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things on the table that get in your way, like with the crowds and and such. So being able to like leap over a building 
and get in your face is pretty uh, valuable. That is. So, okay, let's talk Let's talk about the crowd mechanic because you've mentioned it and um, I, I've mentioned it. So with the crowds, um, they they either you interact with them, you can get them to get in your opponent's way. Um, but once bullets start flying, I mean, these aren't, you know, bovine, you know, cows that are standing in the pasture watching sort of, you know, blankly. As soon as things go wrong um, and the action starts happening, these are people, they interact like that. Um, how, how does that feel? Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, we haven't started our campaign yet, which is uh, I think we'd approach the way we approach the crowds with our you know gangs a little bit differently, mm -hmm. because if you are, you know shooting through a crowd or something, you can you know there's heavy penalties for that in the campaign. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so if you accidentally you know shoot a civilian, uh, that's going to impact you negatively after the game. Um, but yeah, they if. You know, the crowds will panic if you shoot near them. Um, mm -hmm. It's not super likely. Like, you have to roll a 1 on a ten, on, on a d10 roll. Mm -hmm. But we have had it happen. Uh, you know, and then there's a various effects. They can, you know, they can turn on you. Uh, they can just run away or just get in your way. Um, but it's been really interesting to see how that, how they uh, play a, you know, a factor during the game because mm -hmm. they really do. Uh, have a big presence. Yeah, and they're they're in just about every scenario um, that I was going through. Now, there are a lot of scenario options for this game as well. Um, how how do you? I mean, are you having played this is not a test, um, which has similar mechanics. Um, do you feel like this is sort of the evolution of what was sort of presented in that game? Oh, uh, very much so. Um, I think it's like a. This is not a test. It's a really um, great like grab bag of things that we love about other games. Mm -hmm. um, I think Joe mentioned maybe mentioned that on your show that it's just sort of like a, like a greatest hits almost mm -hmm. of like cool mechanics from other places. Um, and that that was great, but Reality Z really feels like an evolution of that, where it's sort of the next iteration of of you know taking the core of that and really pushing it further. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, I think it's a really cool direction to take it because again, it's a sandbox game where, you know, the fluff is minimal, it's miniature agnostic. Mm -hmm. Um, you have like endless options. So make pushing it into that more narrative place, mm -hmm. I think really, um, was like a really good direction. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love how, um, there's, there's, NPC rules as well for like rent a cops and um, you know gang members and you know street punks and you know s drunk salary men and everything in the back. So um, it you don't always necessarily have to be playing like maybe if you and your opponent wanted to have a game where it was you know one of you trying to hack something in. It, it isn't like you are having to constantly have one gang battling another gang. Um, there are rules in there that you can actually, you know, play, um, you know, not a, a head to head fight every single time, um, which I think is very cool as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of scenarios in the book that I'm sort of itching to try. One of them is, uh, and because they're kind of, again, a little bit different from just uh, mm. you and your opponent in sort of a pitch battle fighting over terminals or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, not that any of them are just that, you know, there's, right. there's always like something going on. Um, but there's, there's the scenario that Joe wrote that uses one of the Knights of Dice models, actually, one of our scenery kits, the, the flying noodle cart. Oh, yeah. The, the little ramen cart, mm -hmm. uh, which... When I found out about that, I was, you know, over the moon. I'm like, that's our, my favorite model in our catalog. And yeah. I'm like, this is super cool. Like, we well, have to protect the flying noodle cart uh, as it moves across the table. That's awesome. And it's almost, it's not quite, but it's almost a co-op scenario because it's, you know, right. one, one side, one uh, gang on either side of the cart. And then there's a bunch of NPCs that start spawning every turn. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I just really want to get my... My, my little ramen onto the table and uh it sounds super fun yeah yeah man and that is a cool model too um 
you because you guys have done quite a lot of models that work for a variety of game systems, um, Infinity being one of them. Um, and so I just in looking for terrain for this is not a sorry, not for this is not a test for reality's edge for my tabletop. I've been looking at you guys and I got a ton of your um neon because I'm you know, I grew up in Japan in the 80s and I used to go shopping in Hong Kong, you know, to buy all my clothes. And so between Tokyo and Hong Kong, I grew up in the land of neon. Um, and, you know, nighttime, all you could see is bright neon lights. And I sort of imagine, you know, you get that Blade Runner cyberpunk um, nighttime aesthetic, noir aesthetic for these games. And so for me, it was I really need to have a lot of neon for my tabletop. I, I need to somehow get that. And you guys have a ton. It's at least three sets of signs. I have two of them um, that are acrylic um, counters that you can then, um, they have little holders that you paint and to match your building and stick it to your building. And then because the the bright acrylic attaches to that, it looks like lit neon, which is super cool um, and not something I've added to a tabletop before. And it just looks great. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah. The, 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 the really adds a lot to the feel of that. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and like you're saying, we have a lot of stuff for infinity and stuff. When we first started designing models for a sci-fi setting. Mm -hmm. uh, it was always my intention to go with that sort of 80s, 90s cyberpunk feel rather than the super clean mm -hmm. sci-fi aesthetic that everybody else was sort of does for for Infinity because I didn't see a lot of that stuff out there and I'm a huge fan of that aesthetic. Yeah. You know, growing up on, you know, Ghost in the Shell and mm -hmm. Akira and, and Blade Runner and all that stuff. Um and sort of it was like a way to, you know, have a different approach to that that sort of sci-fi uh, setting. Yeah. Uh, and then for a lot of years after we started doing that, I really wanted a, a cyberpunk game to play with our kids. Mm -hmm. And so this, you know, uh, when I found out about Reality's Edge, I was like completely stoked. I'm like, this is perfect. This is exactly what I want. I love this in a test. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, I love narrative wargaming um and the setting is is perfect yeah. yeah so given that you have access to everything that knights of dice makes um and you're saying you're avoiding the sort of clean science fiction of infinity that sort of aesthetic um i'm planning on using your city range because i got quite a few of your buildings when you had your studio sale um are you also looking to use sort of 20th century buildings with um with extra neon and sort of science fictiony sort of vehicles and vending machines with that or are you looking to use some of your more um sandbox um um i keep wanting to say sandbox hydra but i know that's not that sand sandport hydra yeah stuff? sandport yeah. hydra sorry long day um yeah. the the sandport range um, what are you what are you looking to do in your games? Because I know that you made, you know, cat terminals that actually lit up and um, as I was talking about earlier. And that looks great, but I haven't seen because you keep focusing on sort of the terminals and the models, I haven't seen a lot of the actual background. Yeah, sure. So um I plan on using a mix of, of all of it. Mm. Um I've been sort of, you know, chipping away at my own personal table. Mm -hmm. The few games I've played have been sort of a table I'd made a while ago and that we sort of donated to our club. Um, but yeah, I plan on using a, a bunch of it. Uh, so there's a bunch of, of um, prototypes sitting at work that I'm sort of greedily eyeing off. Mm -hmm. They're just sitting on the shelf, like uh, assembled, and I'm like, oh, yeah. and one of those is uh, recently we went back and redesigned sort of did a reimagining of one of our first kits into like, you know, uh, a bit more of an interesting shape and using a, a few of the techniques that we've learned over the years. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, it, it's, it's a kit that has, it's, it's the reimagining of, um, oh, what's it called? The, the Morrison building, which is one of our first oh, kits. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The original, the original kit is just a square block that's, yeah. you know, uh, you know, almost a foot tall. It sort of takes up, 
um, a, a decent chunk of the table. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reimagined kit is sort of all split into floors. It's got all kinds of balconies and bits and pieces. And then there's also like an extension kit that we have that you can put on the roof. And mm-hmm. so it changes the, the silhouette of the building. Oh, that's cool. And both of those sort of different pieces have like additional floors that you can put on there. Mm-hmm. And so as, as an example, you know, for our website, I built a bunch of those floors and it's just sitting there and it's, it's a huge, uh, beast of a thing yeah it and, is. Uh, yeah yeah because uh, it's got you know four or five additional floors on it and uh skylights and all kinds of things um so i plan on swiping that uh from the shelf because the, have, the morrison have, yeah. building in and of itself is a big piece yeah it is yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah, named after it. um famous melbourne war gamer slash uh, gamer in general mark morrison i'm assuming uh, no, no, it's named after Grant Morrison, the, the comic book uh, writer. Ah, of course, there you go. Yeah, uh, all, all of the, the stuff we did, uh, the Century City stuff that we did originally, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, was nominally with the Batman game in mind. Um, of course. Most of those buildings are named after writers and artists that mm-hmm. have worked on Batman. Well, that's an embarrassing slip. Oops. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> But that makes total sense. Of course, I should have realized that. Um, I just knew that, um, for example, you guys have the Dainty Sezuan, uh restaurant in your Chinatown range. Um, yeah. And I, I have been to, very many times, the Dainty Sezuan restaurant in Mel- uh, Melbourne. And I know that Viv likes to uh, sort of nod to uh, Melbourne's Chinatown in that range. And so I was yeah, making, an, I was inferring too far. Oh, yeah. Well, the Dainty Sash one uh, is one of my favorite restaurants in Melbourne. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm obsessed with hot pot. Uh, yes. I think I'm going to get a hot pot tattoo soon. Like, it's that it's ridiculous of an <laughs> obsession. Nothing wrong with uh, that, man. Yeah. And then, and then they, wanna, they, they do a very good hot pot there. They do. Yeah. They do. Right on. All right. Well, let's talk about – let's get back to Reality's Edge. Let's talk about um, – your crew, because you've got, I know you've been working on a lot of models, but let's talk about your first crew. Um, how did you approach um, crew building in this? Did you sort of hodgepodge, throw it all together just to see what things did on the tabletop? Or did you put a little more thought into it when you were sort of first trying it out? Because I know you guys are still sort of figuring things out. Um, and I guess by extension, where would you go in suggesting things for people who are looking at this game for the first time? Um, the thing I would suggest is just find some models that you like. There's so much depth in the creation, the character creation and, Mm. and, you know, even though there's limited options for, you know, the character classes, which they really are more like character classes, the, the operatives you choose for your, like very RPG like, Mm. um, even though there's, you know, there's the, the options for customizing the classes then after you, right. you know, pick that character is so in depth that it if is. you just find something you think is cool, you can probably set it out pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of what I did for my first crew, which is, you know, the, it's, it's, it's got a bunch, it's got a few infinity models in mm-hmm. it. It's got a bunch of models from human interface, Nakamura tower, mm-hmm. that, that board game with the really great, uh, cyberpunk miniatures. Yes. Um, which you know, I think I think the aesthetic of those is is perfect for that. Um, and it was a police crew, right? Am I getting yeah, that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I had those sitting around, um, and I just thought they were cool models. So I'm like, I'll just build a crew out of this these models I have lying around, mm-hmm. um, and kind of come up with like a narrative reason, and then sort of you know, kind of mostly equip them for what the the models have on them. Just, I don't know, because it was an easy way to go about it. Uh, and yeah, I uh, sort of came up with a backstory of like a, uh, one of the cool things that you do with your showrunner who runs your crew is you mm-hmm. choose a background for them. Yes, right? Yeah. So if they're either, you know, uh, you know, sort of lower class, middle class or uh, upper class and that sort of, tweaks the way they play a little bit and mm-hmm. what they start with. Um, so I kind of had an idea of like a, like a, a socialite sort of like a reality star socialite that had had a sort of kind of six, you know, the daughter of a, uh, 
a, a, some kind of high up functionary in some mega corp. Mm-hmm. Grew up in a, in, in a mega tower thing, and then had a reality show, and then sort of you know went off the rails a bit, and then sort of <laughs> went away to find herself. Became like a master swordsman, <laughs> came back as you do. And now has this new, yeah, and now has this new reality show, which is uh, you know sort of like a cops like reality <laughs> show. Uh, and then has like a crew of sort of officers and detectives around her. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I'm running her as a sprawl Ronin uh, using a, I think it's Miranda something, an infinity miniature. I don't mm-hmm. play infinity, but I'm sure I think that's the name of the miniature or something like that. Mm-hmm. And it's a really cool miniature and like a cool like leather jacket with a sword and an SMG. And um, yeah, so I've been running with that theme. Um, and using a bunch of these like heavily armored cops from uh, Human Interface Nakamura Tower and mm-hmm. sort of uh, a drone from Infinity. So I've got a drone controller in there and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, an enforcer with like a, a big, you know, big LMG. And yeah. Super cool, man. Yeah, it the crew looks phenomenal. Now, um, Nick has come up with something that is very different aesthetically. It looks very, it looks a lot darker. Um, when you guys have been playing out games on the tabletop, um, I know you sort of you know sort of went super themey when you built your crew. Did you have anything that you, you you thought, oh, I should have definitely, I wish I had that when I was um, playing my first couple of games, or did you just feel like that, um, you know, the, the narrative structure of the game sort of makes it that maybe you're not looking for that combo and that it's just really about. Um, you know, the, how you make up your crew sort of determines how you play it. Does that, am I saying this right? Do you see? Yeah. 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 You can, you can definitely optimize your crew. I think it would take a bit like a, a, a few more games uh, to figure that out. Mm-hmm. But the one thing I've noticed that maybe my crew is lacking in the last, in the few games that I've played is maybe more options for hacking. Mm. I haven't. So, uh, the way that you earn, you know, uh, Money in the game is sort of you earn rep from doing certain things mm-hmm. in the scenario, which you know. But the, uh, you can also earn info from hacking terminals, the cat oh, terminals. Of course. Um, yeah. And the so way you can find out secrets and then sell them to people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And mm. you can spend that in a couple of different ways after the game. Um, but my crew doesn't have a console cowboy in in it. Okay. I have an infiltrator in it who has limited hacking, mm-hmm. but she's not very good at it. Got it. And your shadowbacker avatar, which is a, a virtual character, they can't hack a physical terminal uh, unless your showrunner has uh, a piece of equipment called a V-spike, and they can put that into a terminal, mm-hmm. which can then means that that terminal can then be hacked by virtual characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my only sort of options for for hacking. Uh, at the moment, uh, my infiltrator, who's not great at it, or having to get my showrunner in contact with the terminal and then sort of putting the sp- spending in action to put a spike in there and then having to get my show, my shadowbacker over there. Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, so the console cowboy, uh, not to mention all the cool apps that you can take. Yes, uh, exactly, right? Yeah. And apps yeah, so- are sort of... Um, I, I've seen someone describe it as like if you, you take the console cowboy, boy, it's almost like if you want to make an analog to other gaming experiences, it's like they're the wizard and the apps are the spells that they kind of cast, except they're not. They're interacting with um, the Internet. Yeah, yeah, that's, it's a good analogy, um, except that there's like not too many of them that are going to hurt your characters physically. Right. You can definitely be a nuisance. Uh, for instance, the last game that we played, uh, Nick disabled my drone for three turns, and in a game that lasts for eight turns, that was kind of pretty devastating. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't. It meant I couldn't use my drone for three turns, mm-hmm. um, which was really cool. Um, yeah, but it, it does. It, it's kind of like that, but the, it it doesn't feel like it's just a reskinned wizard. Right. It definitely feels like what it's supposed to be. Oh, that's cool. Right on. Yeah. Nice. Well, um, let's talk about some of the classes then. Um, and maybe you can talk about your experience with them as we go through. Um, so you have, of course, your showrunner. And they can be from any of the sort of the the classes that I'm going to go through. Um, and then, of course, they have their shadow backer, 
which is the the corporation that backs them. And that doesn't influence um, the character selection that I'm aware of, that I've read. But again, maybe you can correct me on that. Um, uh, yeah. No, it doesn't. It doesn't impact what you like. What characters you can take. Um, what it does do when you start a campaign is you start. Uh, it's, it's, you, you choose a background for your shadow backer as well. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's called a background, um, but that's really cool. There's a bunch of different options, and that sort of changes the way that they play as well. Right. Kind of like how you choose a background for your uh, shadow showrunner. Mm-hmm. Sorry, uh, but there's a there's way more of them. Right. Uh, and you can you can roll that randomly, or you can choose something that fits your crew. For instance, I chose the big media one mm-hmm. uh, for my crew because they have they are the cast of a reality show. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Nick's crew is a criminal enterprise, which lets you you know, if you do happen to take out a civilian by accident, it's not such a big deal if you're a criminal because it's just the cost of doing business. Yeah. Um. So that's yeah, that's really cool. So then, then there's more customizability with that again. Um. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I'm just flipping through that right now through that section. Um, well, let's let's talk about the the classes, and then we'll come back and talk about how we can theme things. So, of course, there's the console cowboy who we talked about before, and that's sort of your your net runner or your your hacker. Um, you can think about the main character of Neuromancer Case. Um, that would be what we're thinking of there. Now. You have to physically have him on the tabletop or her on the tabletop, correct? You can't have them off the board and then have a uh, a digital avatar for them, like the um, like the sh- uh, shadowbacker, right? Or am I getting that wrong? Yeah, no. As far as I know, you do have to have yeah. your console cowboy is on the table. He just has a mobile hacking rig. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't remember. I think they call it a cyber deck. Yes. So they're sort of you know, in amongst it, seeing what's going on and sort of doing it on the fly. Um, yeah. And they start with a bunch of uh, apps. Mm-hmm. Your cyber deck has stats as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it sort of has hit points and uh, a cyber rating, which is kind of your, your, your stat when you're trying to hack mm-hmm. for sort of either your opposed roles or your stat test, depending on what app you're trying to use or what right. you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, they start with a bunch of um, a bunch of different apps, which I think are randomly determined. Um, yes. Yeah, they are. Um, now there is a Facebook group. Um, of course, there is because there's always a good Facebook group for these games. Um, but there's a great Facebook group um, that we are both a part of, and people have made cards for the apps that you can print out, um, which I think, um, which I've printed out and laminated and have ready to go. Um, and I I think that will make it a lot easier so you're not flipping through the book you actually have the little apps and what each one does um, and you can just put it down and say yep this is what I'm doing here and you can share it across the table with your uh, opponent and yeah I think that'll be I think that's a really good idea Um, that'll actually be very useful uh, because there is quite a lot of things because the rules run deep there's quite a lot to keep track of Mm -hmm. so little aids like that um, and sort of I've been trying to figure out the best ones that I need as well will be very helpful And for the apps, that'd be great. Yeah, and there's also, um, while I'm there, um, there's also a, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the term. I'm sorry, it's been a long day, gang. Um, The, um, not a player guide, uh, a card. um, Quick rules reference, thank you, um, that um, someone else has made that is super handy. Um, They did a a great job on that. They made it look identical to the book. It's Mm -hmm. got page numbers in it. It was something that's like sort of solely lacking from the book mm-hmm. as well as like a sort of comprehensive index. I think that's one of the, the limitations of the book, yeah. which I'm, I'm going to assume is a, a page count thing from Osprey. Yes. Um, which, you know, that's, you know, you, that's, you, that, you know, they've got the, you, you know, there's the limitations to sort of the printing cost. It's mm. a huge book. There's a it lot is a of, huge book. There's a lot of meat in there. So uh, mm. I don't really begrudge them sort of having to, to cut out the, the extras like that. Yeah, exactly. But that, that's, yeah, I've also printed that out and laminated it, and that's going to come in very handy. Yeah, man. Yeah, just talking about how thick the book is, um, I it has been my bedtime reading for the last two weeks, and I'm a very fast reader, and I often read for a fair bit of time before I go to bed every night, and I am astonished at how little I've gotten through the book. 
Um, you know, I tear through narrative books like they're like nothing. And I'm reading this. And of course, it doesn't read like a narrative book. But even then, oh, it's there's a I mean, Joe put an unbelievable amount of work into this game um, and it shows. And uh, it's one of those things that I, th- I think, as you say, I think it, it once you get on the tabletop, it plays, you know, fairly cleanly um, and it, it plays well. Um, but then when you want to go back and add things and you want to add the depth and you want to have that narrative, be- the story grow between games, mate, it's all here. Um, yeah, for sure. The, it's yeah. The, the, the depth of it is really impressive. Yeah. yeah it's a very, it's a very impressive package, especially um, given that it's a miniature agnostic game. Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, this feels like something that a team of developers play tested for a long time. And, you know, yes, uh, there were play testers that play tested it for a while. Um, I know, Joe, of course, this is not a test. It, you could even call it a bit of a play test. But, I mean, this feels really polished and it feels really well put together. And, yeah, I'm I'm just I'm I'm constantly impressed when I flip a page and go oh my god i didn't even think to put that in there and there's this and no and there's more and you know and you can upgrade weapons and all the different cybernetics and things you can be addicted to and what the crowd's gonna do and it's just nuts yeah it's 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 really cool and and it's also like it seems like a lot of the options that is included are just because it's fun and that's great like it, you know, there'll be a bit of flavor text and then, you know, oh, your guy's dead. Why don't you just go and clone him mm-hmm. if you have the cash to do it? Like, that's that's super fun. Um, yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. It's sort of – and it's fun to be able to let your, let the players kind of do, like, you know, oh, I kind of want to do this. And you're like, well, it's probably, it's probably in there. Mm-hmm. It's, like, always more fun to let players do something rather than restrict them from doing something. So Yeah. Agreed. Um, oh, and just getting, so cybernetics are a part of this game. Like you can lose a limb and then, oh, no problem. Grow one back or have a, have a Chrome one put in. Um, but I love how as the more mechanical, um, you, you become, um, the less humanity you have. Um, and how that actually plays out on the tabletop and you can go sort of psychotic. Um, they, it's, the depth is crazy um, and it's cool. And, the, you know, there's consequences for everything that you do to your characters. And it just, it, as you say, it, it feels very role play, but it's a tabletop game at the same time. It's amazing. I, I, I'm a huge fan of how this, how this game is made and how it's laid out. Um, and I just, I really want to get playing it because it, it feels right. Yeah, it definitely does. Uh, that Cybershock thing is something that we keep forgetting about now, you know, because there's a lot to sort of, you know, sort of pass through. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the ones that we keep sort of like forgetting that, oh, yeah, that's a thing. That's a test that we need to make mm-hmm. in a certain circumstance. But, um, yeah, it's super cool. Like every Everything feels very in theme and, uh, and serving kind of a narrative function. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. And as, and as I said, everyone can have cybernetics added to them, um, either at the beginning or over the course of the games, um, depending on either they want to upgrade themselves or if they lose a body part or whatever reason. But there is actually a cyborg character class. That's one of the, the character types that you can have. And there's differentiated between a light and a heavy um, cyborg. So if you want to have... Um, I guess like the the character from uh, Ghost in the Shell, or I guess would that be an infiltrator? And it, anyway, um, um, well, I mean, I, you could I guess you could do it either way, but yeah. she's she's pretty, she's basically a, a brain in a in a body, right? Like, right. Yeah. So I, I would, you'd probably you could probably get away with a, like a light cyborg yeah, or something. Light cyborg for her versus like the giant mech machine, um, you know, RoboCop, um, or the Ed Two Hundred Nine. The isn't there? Yeah, it was the Ed two hundred nine in like RoboCop two that had a brain in it or something. Um, I think that yeah, was right. um, yeah. that would be the heavy one. Um, ooh, RoboCop. Ooh, another thing I could sort of look at for this game. Anyway, sorry. Um, 
but yeah, so we have the cyborgs, um, which are, you know, definitely part of the cyberpunk aesthetic. Um, any, have you had any experiences with, uh, cyborgs? Yeah, I've been playing against Nick's heavy cyborg and I've sort of started out another, uh, heavy cyborg for my next crew, which is going to be that one with the, the suicide squad models in it. Mm-hmm. Um, which I'm sort of just sort of just ripping the conceit of Blade Runner, basically doing mm-hmm. sort of a, a replicant crew. Nice. So my heavy cyborg I'm treating as like a, a big mining unit. Mm-hmm. So his, uh, I'm also using a night models model for that. Have you seen, there's like a, a Joker pack mm-hmm. uh, that has a massive, clown in there it's, yes it's really huge sort of got like a, a, a cut off like denim like battle jacket on with studs and like um yeah so i've, I've converted that model i just put a gun in its hand basically but mm-hmm. i'm gonna use that run that as a heavy cyborg that's awesome um yeah uh and nick's heavy cyborg is pretty punishing uh sort of has a lot of hp is pretty hard to take down mm-hmm. one thing i think that's really cool about the the chrome stuff is if you have no chrome, there, there's like uh, character types mm-hmm. um, or, or operative. I, I don't remember what the term is, but uh, basically, if you have no chrome, your classified as human. Mm-hmm. If you have some chrome, you're class- classified as an augment, which means you can suffer from cyber shock, but it's kind of hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, your chrome can sort of go haywire and make your brain go a bit weird. Um, and then there's cyborg, which is the third sort of category, mm. which means you have enough chrome that you're basically not human anymore. Mm-hmm. And one of the cool things is during the campaign, if you add enough chrome to your one of your characters, their type can change to cyborg if you end up um, giving them enough chrome. Oh, nice. And with all the drawbacks that come with that too. So, um, so yeah, if you accumulate enough pieces of, of machinery, like replace enough of your body parts with Chrome, you actually do end up counting as a cyborg, which I think was pretty cool. Yeah. Again, there are consequences for the choices that you make and yeah, yeah super cool. Oh, um, well let, let's, let's talk about the next one. Cause I know this is a character class that you have experience with the drone jockey. Um, now that, that could be, um, you know, a, 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 a ground pounding attack drone that maybe is on two or four legs, um, like a, a weapon servitor kind of, uh, situation. If you're familiar with the 40 K aesthetic, or if you wanted to have sort of the little flying drones that we're sort of familiar with today, right. Um, what, I mean, there's, there's, uh, there's flying combat drones, like gun drones, and then there's flying, um, surveillance drones, which are the ones that you've been playing around with? So I've been running a predator drone. A predator drone is a sort of quadrupedal, mm-hmm. uh, drone. Uh, and there's sort of a close combat variant and sort of a, a range combat variant. I've mm-hmm. been running a range, a range combat variant. Mm. Um, and the drone is cool because it doesn't count towards your, uh, amount of operatives, uh, right. which, you know, you only have a maximum of six. But you choose your drone jockey, and it's basically a piece of equipment, mm-hmm. except with with all its own stats and sort of um, yeah. And there's the four drones, the four basic drones. But then in the advanced equipment, which you can't sort of take at the start, you kind of have to hunt down during your campaign. There are other types of drones you can get as well. Oh, nice! Uh, I haven't seen that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've been I've been running a, a range drone. Uh, I've been playing against Nick, running a, his close combat drone. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's interesting, an interesting mechanic because of the way that your drone gains um, AP. So uh, the very basic activation system of the game, um, I'm, I think Joe might have talked about it, uh, mm-hmm. and if anyone's played, this is not a test, it's it's the same. You make a metal test, you're, all your characters have a metal stat. That's right, uh, yep. Which is kind of just an overall quality of your character, basically. Mm-hmm. So how quick they are to react pretty much so you, you'll you'll choose a character to activate uh and you'll roll a d10 uh you're looking for a 10 uh so you it's your dice roll plus your stat mm-hmm. uh, plus your metal stat if you get a 10 you get to your play your character gets two action points and right. there's a bunch of stuff you can do with that if you fail it then uh you only get one action point and then play passes to your opponent um so it's not an i go you go or an alternating activation it's sort of yeah, something a bit, a bit different. Um, but the way the drone jockey works is 
your drone jockey can spend one of its available AP mm -hmm. uh, to activate your drone, and then your drone will get two AP. So the drone's actually interesting because if your drone jockey fails their activation, they can still activate the drone with the one AP that they get, and the drone will still get the two, uh, two, two AP. AP. Oh, that's cool. I was gonna. That was actually my next question was, does the drone jockey have to control the drone during the course of the game, or can it go off, go off and do other things? Um, I guess the answer is both. Uh, well, so, but your drone jockey or your drone, actually, I think it's it's the, the drone that determines this, has a zone of control. Oh, okay. So, the zone, so it can only be, with, it has to be within a certain distance of uh, the drone jockey. Right. I think from memory, most of them are 12 inches. Mm-hmm. So at least the drone I've been running is. Uh, so your drone jockey has to be within 12 inches of the drone. And I have found myself caught out a few times by failing that activation, giving the the, the one AP to the drone, and then the drone running off and doing something because you kind of like get excited and then your drone jockey's out of, out of that zone of control and you have to sort of bring them back in so that you can activate the drone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, also, drone yeah, just I, sit, the drone just sits there until you get to it, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Actually, and yeah, you can't. Your drone can't act independently. You always have to spend that one AP with your drone jockey to um to give it uh to to sort of bring it to life. That's cool, man. I like that. That's a uh, that's a really cool mechanic because it it actually feels like a remote control vehicle, um, but it also gives the drone jockey sort of um you know providing they are able to pass their test, um the ability to do a few other things at the same time. Um, yeah, you know, I mean not literally. Not a few other things at the same time, but to do something else, to multitask. If I'm not mistaken, I think you can actually take two drones per drone jockey as well. So there could be a situation where you're trying to juggle two drones at once, and that might be quite difficult. I might be wrong on that. It's somebody who's it discussing sounds, that. Yeah, yeah, it sounds right. I think I've read yeah. that. Mm. Well, the next character class is the Enforcer. Now, the Enforcer is sort of like a, a retired soldier or sort of your, your action-y uh, type hero model, um, sort of a tough, uh, experienced uh, sold, um, warrior, I guess, but not to be confused with... Um, the the street samurai which or the street running which we'll get to in a bit which is sort of your modern day uh samurai so the enforcers um have you you've been running one i have yeah yeah so they they, they have a rule uh called bodyguard mm -hmm. which sort of allows them to sort of uh protect your show runner um which is pretty cool that is cool um they can also swap that for this i think the sort of intended as sort of your most capable sort of actual like kind of soldier warrior type. Mm -hmm. um, but they, they can also swap their, their bodyguard rule for a rule called up armed, which lets you take sort of the big guns. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, your mini guns and, and grenade launchers and support weapons like that, mm -hmm. um, which I've done with my, my uh, enforcer. Mm hmm. Uh, so I could give them a you know a big machine gun. Um, yeah. I think it's LMG that I took, uh, which you know is just pretty punishing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so yeah, I think they're just that's that's they're pretty straightforward. They have sort of their you know they're just good at uh, at fighting, which you know your you, the characters aren't really intended to be sort of professional soldiers. They're more sort of like scrappy sort of like street punks trying to make a go of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's the one character that sort of, you know, with a bit of training or, or at least experience to sort of uh, do that kind of thing. Nice. And do you feel that um, having someone with a heavy weapon um, is a big advantage? Is that is, or is it, again, is it have upsides and downsides um, and sort of balance out? It does. Most of the heavy weapons do have a downside, so they'll be like move or fire mm -hmm. or, uh, for instance, the minigun has a rule called unreliable, which mm -hmm. means it can jam. Um, you know, you, I, I think the, the gun that I put on mine has move or fire, but I gave them a, a piece of equipment that sort of negates that rule, So, mm -hmm. which is the articulated weapon harness. That's right. Which is, yeah, so... Uh, Almost like when you see a steady cam or like a camera rig that sort of has mm -hmm. that uh, motion control or yeah, 
uh, which is pretty cool, I think. It is. It's very much like the heavy machine gun uh, people from Aliens. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. which is super cool. It is. Um, I mostly just gave him the heavy weapon because the model had a, a big machine gun slung over her shoulder and I thought it looked cool so I'm like oh I'll take that but uh it it does when it hits it hits very hard so it's um and then the way you take damage in the game is sort of uh rather than having wounds everybody has HP Mm -hmm. uh and the damage that you take will be you know half of the weapon's strength rounded up oh Uh, I missed the big guns tend to have uh, pretty high strength. Yes. So when they hit, when they hit, it's, uh, it's pretty upsetting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So they do a lot of damage. I, yeah, I was wondering how that works. Okay. That that's good to know. Okay, cool. Well, you did mention um, the enforcers being sort of better than, uh, you know, <laughs> street trash. So I think that just means that we got to segue into some some street trash. Um, <laughs> uh, like any other uh, good urban combat game, we have the generic ganger, um, you know, street gang members or just sort of low level enforcers slash punks um, that you can add to a crew. Now, what I love about these guys is they're cheap. Um, and in a game where you have a max of, I think, six models in your crew, it's very small size, you can take two of these, um, and they have, um, they sort of give each other strength, uh, you know, they, they prop each other up with morale wise, um, because, you know, they kind of came from the same place and they're, they're buddies. Um, and I thought that was really, that was a really cool rule that, um, you know, gang pride surprising, you know, supporting one another, um, in a game gang that's so small model count wise. Anyway, um, have you seen these on the tabletop? Are they, are they just garbage or, um, do they have I've, their place in a crew? I have been running them. Um, the, I've been running one, just one cause I didn't have the, the funds to get mm-hmm. to buy two, you know, the two for the one slot thing. Mm-hmm. Um, there's been I've had limited success. They're not, you know, their stats aren't actually that much worse than everybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's just that they don't they don't have any kind of sort of interesting edge that they to them really. Right. They're just so, sort of no kind of specialist kind of role at all. Which it tend that that I find it that you do tend to use that stuff uh, with the characters that have more of a specialist kind of role. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are good. They are good for sort of just, you know, distracting or, or firing off pot shots or any of, you know, getting just getting in the way. Mm-hmm. And because, yeah, again, with such a low model count game, uh, that's sort of pretty valuable sometimes. Yeah. Just sort of chuck, chuck the chaff in the way. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. And not too worried about them. Yeah. Yeah, and if they die, yeah, they die. Uh, yeah, that yeah. were cheap, so yeah. it's uh, not a huge loss. Yeah, I was because um, I have some beautiful Yakuza models that were painted up by a um, friend of the show, Patch. Oh, yeah, those, um, are, those are great. Right? They're so good. Uh, but I've, you know, I've got, you know, a Yakuza boss with a sword and a submachine gun, an Uzi, um, and then two guys in suits next to him with Uzis. And I was thinking, do I run them as enforcers or do I run them as gangers um, and have sort of. You know the 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 showrunner with his two minions hanging out with them. Um, do I run one of them as an enforcer? I think that's if I think either I'm going to run one as an enforcer or run if I run both of them, I'll run them as gangers um, just to take sort of that two for one aspect, um, which I thought was very cool. But yeah, just hmm, one how of, do I sneak one, that in? One of the things with your showrunner background, if you choose the lower class. Uh, sort of one, or if you roll that, if you decide to randomize it, um, mm-hmm. your gang has actually become cheaper oh, because they're from the streets, so they become slightly cheaper. So that that's what I've done with my second crew that you know I haven't played with yet. That that replicant crew, mm-hmm. they're, they're sort of I've got a couple of gangers in there um, with that background for my showrunner, so it made them a little bit cheaper. Nice. Yeah. Mm, I'm going to have to look at that Um, because, you know, that definitely fits my um, sort of Japanese themed uh, organized crime crew. Uh, 
narrative that I'm I'm putting together. All right. Um, the next class is the Infiltrator, which uh, is goes beyond sort of a modern day ninja. Um, we have, I mean, in a, in a world that's sort of so technologically advanced um, and yet dystopian at the same time, um, infiltrators, as you said earlier, need to have an aspect of um, technological skill. Um, to break into places and to sneak around, um, to get around cameras and um, security systems. Uh, and now you have had experience running with these. Um, in, in in an objective game, these sound like a very valuable class to have. Um, definitely, and because they can hack and they can and they sort of deploy later. They have a rule that lets them sort of deploy. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, anywhere on the table, uh, mm -hmm. as long as it's sort of 12 inches away from an enemy model and they're hiding. Cool. Um, and because they can, they do have that ability to hack a terminal, which, you know, uh, as important as the terminals are, you have kind of limited options with who can actually access them. Mm. Uh, it's basically the console cowboy uh, and, yeah, and your shadow backer avatar, which is a digital character. It's mm -hmm. not actually on the you know, in meat space. So, and then again, and as I was saying before, you have to get your showrunner to, uh, you know, uh, put the spike in the terminal to be yeah. able to do that. Uh, so then being able to deploy anywhere, you can just sort of drop them right on a terminal and try and start hacking that info straight away, yeah. even though they're not great at it. Um, so they have very limited hacking ability, um, but being able to, uh, to deploy anywhere is cool. They also have a really cool piece of equipment. They come with an EMP grenade, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, you can sort of just drop that and sort of like try to nerf anything with a, an, an on-off uh, rule because you can hack people's weapons in this game mm -hmm. and turn them off uh, or drones or basically anything electronic. Um, you can hack somebody's mechanical arm if you want. Awesome. And try and turn that off. So that's a pretty cool thing. It's like a once one use per game thing. Uh, you throw a EMP grenade. Um, so I think that does a lot for the flavor of like, uh, you know, using that to disable security systems or like mm -hmm. sort of get themselves out of a jam and almost like a digital smoke bomb or something. Yeah, Pretty exactly. Cool, yeah. Yeah, man, it's very cool. I'm, I'm, I love the, the feel of that. And I love the, um, the, the, just the way that whole aesthetic that, you know, they're not necessarily great at hacking, but they can get in there and they can get going quickly. Now, can you explain um, how, because you said there's there's four terminals per mission. Um, and how does that typically lay out? I mean, they're just sort of, uh, sort of keyboards and screens that, that you interact with on the tabletop. Um, can you sort of explain it to people who have not read the book how that basically... Uh, it, they're just objectives that you interact with, correct? They are objectives that you interact with, but they're not necessarily the most important objective in the scenario. Mm. I, if I'm not mistaken, right. there are four of them on the table in every scenario. Mm, pretty sure. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, and so you will get, I think you get victory points for, uh, for hacking them. And you'll also get sort of info, which can be used after the game. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, and uh, if you ever played the Batman game, they deploy kind of similar to that, where you sort of alternate placing them, right? Um, and they, you know, can be a certain distance away from uh, models and from each other. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's pretty similar to the way that the, the street lights are placed in Batman. That's right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so you, you kind of uh, I found that because we haven't started playing campaign games yet, we haven't sort of we've sort of been not as focused on them. I think once we start, they're stopping consequences after mm -hmm. the game. I think they'd be a lot more important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool that that's, that's always something that you're always hunting for info. Basically you're always trying to get sort of, um, the, the, the word on the street yeah, or, exactly. you know, that even when you've got other things to worry about, you sort of like the temptation is always there. Mm hmm. And that is sort of the temptation, isn't it? That like, ooh, do I pull one of my models off to try and get more goss or, you know, get the, the hidden intel on something? Or do I fight for the objective? Like, what am I doing here? And I think that's 
that's a really cool dynamic that has been added to the game that just again adds that depth especially if you're playing in uh, a campaign where you know you might desperately need more money uh all of a sudden well there's a way of you can do that but it might mean you're going to lose a scenario to get what you need um and it just adds yeah, yeah it, it's really cool exactly and i think it's really cool that they are not the f- the focus of every scenario mm mm-hmm. mhm that it's it's always something that's there and it's always something you can do, but you do have other things to worry about. I think that's really uh, makes it really interesting. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Well, let's let's talk about the speaking of interacting um, with the tabletop. Uh, let's talk about the character class that was mentioned earlier. That may be one of my favorite additions um, to the sort of the genre um, in in the in the world of social media that we live in now, and we can imagine in the dystopian near future when this might be set. Um, influencers, uh, will definitely have, uh, you know, uh, a part on the tabletop and that's what this character class does. Um, they are sort of the, the next gen social influencer or social media influencer. They are called the mask and they can, um, interact with the non-player characters on the board. They can hide in them and they can sort of deploy from them. Um, have you worked with, I mean, it sounds like you've done some, because you have that whole social media aspect to your, uh, or reality television aspect to your crew, you have a mask, don't you? Am I making that up? No, I don't actually run a mask in that crew. Oh. Uh, but Nick has been running a mask as his showrunner. Mm. So I've, I've seen them in action. Um, and it's some, some pretty cool mechanics. Uh, he, there is an app uh, that you can get. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the mask has, oh, no, maybe the mask doesn't have apps. No, uh, the the Nick. I know Nick was very keen on this app because one mm-hmm. of the things a mask can do is blend into crowds really easily. That's right. I mean, anyone can blend into a crowd. They just have they're just better at it. Right. Uh, so and and when you're blending into crowds, you can kind of blend into a crowd on one part of the board and then pop out of another crowd on the other another part of the board. Mm-hmm. Um, which is pretty cool. Sort of you just sort of cool. like slip slip into the crowd and you know. Uh, your opponent loses track of you, mm-hmm. and the mask is is better at doing that. Uh, and I know something that Nick was really wanting to get. There's a there's an app uh, called uh, Adora or Summon Adora. Mm-hmm. Basically, you 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 do a uh, you project a, a holographic projection of a pop star yep. on the wall, and it can summon more bystanders and more crowds basically every turn while it's sitting there. Um, as people come to try and check out like this, this sort of hologram of mm-hmm. Tupac or whatever, you know, like, um, and Nick did get that and he sort of was using it a lot in our last game and mm-hmm. just kept summoning more and more crowds, uh, to the point where I've got a lot of civilian miniatures and we sort of had it all, every single one that I owned on the table. <laughs> That's um, awesome. And he was just going nuts on these crowds and sort of, uh, using his mask to sort of pop in and out of them and, um. And using them to get in my way, and uh, it was really cool. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I love the Idoro. Um, it's from a William Gibson book. I, um, in fact, I've, it's shown up several times in them. But yeah, they, that's that's so cool that this is that's in the game, and that that actually has a direct uh, influence on uh, the rules and you know the bystanders. It's it's just a neat mechanic, um, and the fact that not only do you get sort of the Gangs of Rome crowd mechanic. Um, there's a character class that actually interacts with them. I just, I just love that. I think that is such a, a neat um, nod to the modern, you know, in real life world, um, which is, is super cool. Um, yeah. Well, there's uh, another character in here, the Street Doc, um, which, if you, you know, are a fan of um, different Gibson stories and cyberpunk, you'll know that you know the Street Doctor is a trope uh and i'm glad that that's in there it, it feels very feels very uh like an old friend um when you see that one um and they can sort of patch people up um they can be the the surly um you know heart of gold doc and you know trying to patch people up trying to help those people out or they can be sort of um you know malicious trying to not necessarily malicious but uncaring um, mercenary trying to get, just get their money and go home kind of uh, mentality. It's just it's it's a really cool um, character class. 
Yeah, I haven't had a chance to play with one or against one yet, mm. but I have put one in my second crew that mm-hmm. I haven't managed to get on the table yet. Uh, but that's that, that's like from a thematic standpoint, a sort of if the you know keeping the the replicants like extending their lifespan was kind of my idea of putting that in the crew, nice. so he's there to patch them up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he he kind of comes with like a collapsible staff that and uh and stuff and does some kind of cool things can heal your guys on the tabletop mm-hmm. and can um, help them if they've been taken out of action to keep them sort of you know to to help reduce the uh chance that in sort of post-game effects when you're rolling to see what happens because you know when you roll you, you, oh character's dead oh how many times has that happened in necromunda or a game like that where you're like ah, oh, you know tiny little scratch oh dead um your street doc can help you know with with those result rolls so um to mitigate you know the awful effects of what might happen yeah they they actually give your guys a bonus to their morale if they're within a certain sort of distance Mm -hmm. of them too because i guess they're sort of you know oh i guess he can just patch me up that's right Um, yeah yeah um so i'm looking forward to putting that on the table uh i actually armed that character with a taser so they don't have a lethal weapon at all so nice. i'm pretty keen to see how that works so it sounds pretty fun being able to knock a character out for a turn mm-hmm. rather than them taking damage oh man that sounds great uh it, yeah it, again fitting that narrative you know you have the person who's trying not to take life and trying to heal life but of course they need a weapon on the tabletop in this dark world and you know taser boom perfect um, we have our sprawl Ronin, who I've been calling a street Ronin the whole time, like a numpty. Um, now that is, of course, you know, your street samurai or um, my fave, because I'm a big Neuromancer fan, um, Razor Girls, Razor Boys, whatever you want to call them. But um, this would be what Molly was, um, that very famous character from that. Um, and from Johnny Mnemonic, if you want to read the book, not the movie, but uh, I guess she was technically in there, but with a different name. Anyway, um, you know, sort of the badass warrior um, class that is different from the Enforcer, has very different rules and very different stats. Um, and of course, this had to be the one that I had as my showrunner when I started out because it is just too cool not to have it. Um, have you, I mean, you have one of these. Yeah, I have one as my showrunner. Yeah. Um, and she's a, sort of a, a melee beast. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, that's, it's actually kind of tricky to sort of get, uh, you know, get them across the table into where you need to be. I've found that the melee, the melee stuff is kind of hard to, mm. to negotiate. But, you know, that, that I might get more used to that as, as, um, as the game sort play. of goes on. One thing that you do when you build your crew is you you can take a uh, a stat increase every time. Like you, every character gets a stat increase mm-hmm. that you get to choose when you uh, are building your crew mm-hmm. when you first. So it's another, there's another little level of customization. Yeah, I was, gonna, I was going to bring that up yep. after we got through them. So do it now because it's good. So I know is it it's like three or four options for every class. That yeah, you that's get right. to um, look at it and go, oh, cool. Um, I will um, take, for example, plus one movement and plus one aim, or I'll take plus one aim and plus one. Um, ooh, M E L. Um, melee, I think. Oh yeah, melee. Yeah, that's right. Or I can take plus two melee. Or, you know, there's different. You can add different things depending on what it is you want your character to have or, you know, extra hit points or health points. Um, sorry, you were saying, so with the oh, was... Sprawl Roman's characteristics, I mean, there is a, there's a pretty big variety of what you can add. There um, are. I was just going to suggest that you uh, take them, take one of the, the movement options because trying to get them, you know, in range of where their sword can do some damage. Mm-hmm. So yeah, is, is, is a good thing. Oh, that's uh, cool. Something I've struggled with in the few games that we've played, but uh, you know that's just luck of the circumstance, I think. Mm. And um, this is a three by three table, so we are playing is, this it, on a small yeah. board. But it is, as you say, it is eight turns. Um, it is eight turns. Yeah. So yeah, you are sort of limited on how many turns you have to get around the board and to do the things you need to do, um, even though it is a small board. So having that extra movement would definitely help. Definitely. And uh, with the with the variable sort of 
action points if you're failing activations and mm -hmm. might take you a little bit longer to get around the board. We've been playing with quite dense terrain too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, dense terrain plus crowds plus, you know, other characters in your way and terminals and stuff, it, it can you know, there's, there's, it can kind of get challenging to move around. But, uh, you know, uh, it's nice. just... Yeah, so I don't know. Um, I took the extra movement and still sort of haven't managed to make her as effective as I'd like just yet. Mm. But uh, but it's it's a cool it's a cool uh, character and and super iconic for the the um yeah the thing. It's it's probably after the console cow cowboy is sort of the most iconic trope I think. Literally like, took the words out of my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. That it it you know between. Um, I think Neuromancer helped sort of define the the genre, and between Case and Molly, I think there you go. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah, you have both. Well, that leaves us with one character class left, and that's the one we talked about before, the Tracer, who is sort of, as we talked about, sort of the cybernetically enhanced um, parkour guy running around the board. It's sort of like the foot version of a uh, bike messenger, except on you know, cybernetic <laughs> enhancements and drugs, uh, zooming around the board to get things done. Um, now you've said that you've seen this on the tabletop. Yeah. Nick's tracer has been a, a nuisance to me and, uh, all the games that we've played. And that's just because it's everywhere where you want to be. It pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Surprisingly very effective just because of that maneuverability. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, he's kind of, gone to the nines with the right kind of chrome on it and being able to sort of, you know, enhance it so that it can just bound around and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, pretty cool. That it has cool. a, they have a rule where they sort of ignore some climbing and some falling stuff. Uh, and that sort of makes them very able to sort of just clamber over buildings and, uh, and other obstacles and cars and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So this it sort of feels exactly like it should, I think. Nice. Yeah. It, it Again, it, it feels like something that would exist um, thinking about, I mean, how popular, you know, maybe parkour is now um, just having and, you know, how in action movies that sort of translated in. If you look at 70s action movies versus action movies today, there's a lot more, you know, running, jumping over, under, around things. Um, and it's sort of in our mentality. And the fact that that's actually a character type that they put into this game um, feels feels good, feels right. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's really cool that it's there. Um, now, something that I did notice with, I was going to say was the variable stats, um, but another way you can customize your characters. Um, now, there are weapon types um, that each character, quote unquote, can take. Um, I think that can take is not necessarily the right verb because when I was trying to figure out how to arm the models that I already had and make them characters. Let's go, this one doesn't fit because, you know, it doesn't necessarily have the weapon that I necessarily want. But that's only to get a bonus. Um, you can literally um, arm your characters from the basic weapon list right off the bat. Um, you just don't get maybe a bonus to use them. Um, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So each character class has a favored weapon right. type, basically. Mm -hmm. And... It's not a weapon that you have to take or that you start with. You still have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. It's just that they are so comfortable using that weapon that right. they get a bonus to hit with it. It's a plus one bonus to hit, basically, for mm -hmm. if they're using that weapon. And there'll, there'll be some sort of – it'll give you a few options in there for your primary weapon set. And you for pick instance, one of those, right? You do, yeah. yeah so, I'm for sorry. instance, the, the Tracer has an SMG – a one melee weapon or a handgun mm -hmm. and sort of if it's sort of broad like that like a handgun it means anything you know with the handgun rule or mm -hmm. from that category um whereas the smg is is um a specific weapon right um so yeah you pick one of those and then you get a bonus to hit with it which again just gives your character even like a bit more personality i think absolutely which is pretty cool yeah, yeah agreed and you can there are a lot of variations within the weapon systems. For example, if you're looking at handguns, um, you can have the traditional, just the basic pistol, but you could also have like a machine pistol or a light submachine gun. Um, 
And then, you know, if you get into the heavier weapon class, you could have heavier submachine guns. Um, and so there, there is differentiation there as well. And each one has its own set of stats um, as far as range and strength and, um, you know, ammunition and all that. So it's, it's, it's really cool. And there's just a lot to it. And that, I mean, I'm not even getting into the additional equipment lists. Um, Oh, there's so much cool stuff. Right? I mean, I, that alone is something I've been going, I've been reading for the last week. And there's so many cool, I mean, you're talking about the data spike, um, that your showrunner has, and it's, it's literally a spike. Um, it's, it's like, you know, they're sort of the, the most forceful hack ever. They did, you know, takes this, um, you know, cylinder and jams it over the port, um, you know, the, the quote unquote USB port or whatever you want to call it on, on the terminal. And it, it literally just jams in the sort of forces the square peg into the round hole and then, you know, tries to force a hack through it um, at the same time, um, destroying, you know, the, the jacket in the process. It's like the lock pit set from hell, um, digital version. Um, and it, you know, again, really cool aesthetic and you can just imagine your showrunner running up to the terminal and smashing this into the 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 jack and then turning around and spraying the person behind them with an smg kind of thing um very cool yeah it's awesome uh one of the other cool things with the weapons is uh some of them have uh a concealable yes so that so if you're carrying a you know like an assault rifle or something, you can't just sort of s stash that in your jacket, mm -hmm. and that has consequences on the tabletop. If you're mm -hmm. trying to sort of blend into crowds and stuff, it's harder if you have non-concealable weapons. Unsurprisingly, yep. <laughs> yeah, which I think is a really cool uh, rule as well. Sort of agreed. Uh, you can it, it really again it's, it adds that narrative thing. Sort of if you're running across the table trying to sort of slip into the crowd and you sort of just stash the gun and then sort of put your hands in your pockets. It's like, it's pretty evocative. I think it's really cool. Yeah. No, I agreed. Um, and again, some of the equipment, um, that you carry does similar things. If I'm, if I've read it right, um, depending on how big it is and what you are trying to do. Um, maybe well, there's also, you can get a, you know, if you have a cyber arm and then one of the higher end upgrades is, you know, having a gun that integrates into your arm. Mm -hmm. So it's, disappears back into the arm and gets the concealable rule. I think that's really cool. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Again, it feels super cyberpunky. Um, it, yeah. Perfect. It's perfect. Right on. Well, Scott, we've been talking for quite a while now about this game. Um, I've sort of run out of my notes as far as things that I wanted to touch on this evening. Um, you've actually played this game. Um, significantly more than I have. In fact, I, I'm looking forward to playing my first game of it soon. That said, it looks great. Um, do you have any more thoughts about um, how it plays, um, what you like about it, what, what you don't like, anything? Um, tell, us, tell us your thoughts. Anything else? Or have we sort of done a comprehensive talk through as we've gone tonight? Yeah, I think like, uh, I'm looking forward to starting campaign games mm -hmm. um, because that isn't something that we've done yet. We've sort of just been sort of kicking the tires a little bit and right. trying to get used to the rules, mm -hmm. uh, which, again, are quite dense. Um, so I think it takes a, a little bit of getting used to mm -hmm. just because there are a lot of things to keep track of because of that sort of depth of customization. Right. Um, but very much looking forward to the campaign stuff. And it seems... Uh, again, very neg narrative focused, and uh, this is like something that sets it apart from other sort of campaign games that I've played. It seems that progress is very difficult. Right. So m your characters won't. Your characters are all freelancers at the start, apart from your showrunner. That's so at the right. Beginning, your showrunner is the only one that gains experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, you 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 need to sort of hire your freelancers on a permanent basis, which they may not do. That's a sort of a, a dice roll and, mm -hmm. and it's a, and you can only sort of try and do that with one character per game. So it'll take you a while to get to a point where a crew is sort of, everybody's getting better. Yeah. Um, which I think is interesting, uh, because it sort of postpones that sort of late game, late campaign thing where there's sort of a very heavy imbalance in the mm -hmm. crews, which, you know, playing a, a lot of Mordheim or games like that, that, that sort of 
the inevitability of that once yes. someone starts getting on a roll. Mm-hmm. And someone um, else has a couple of characters that died, you know, randomly. All of a sudden, you can start to feel really uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. And then it's sort of that's that sort of in my experience sort of ends up being the death knell of the campaign once it starts sort of yeah. tipping too far one way. Exactly. Um, it seems like it'll be a bit more sustainable for a bit of a longer term because the progress is so hard fought. Um, yeah, yeah, very much looking forward to sort of getting some link games and, and starting up a thing sort of, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that about hiring the characters because I, I found that to be a really interesting mechanic um, because, you know, you you have you do sort of become attached to certain characters. But, I mean, you can chop and change your crews out of the freelancer part um, pretty freely, which, I mean, guess it makes sense if you it's your showrunner and, you know, their, their shadow backer, sort of their, the, it's their story. And then as your showrunner, um, you know, both builds the trust of the people they work with. You know, they learn that the people who work for them learn that they're dependable. And at the same time, um, they figure out that these are the people I need to have all the time. They can actually hire them on permanently. And then, um, as you say, they start accruing um, experience. So, um, again, it feels in a land of... um, where we actually work, where, you know, there are people who are consultants who come in. (laughs) Again, this feels like part of the modern world or an extension of it or, you know, the next logical step. And I think it's, I can't think of another game that really does that. And um, yeah, I think Joe's done a really good job of putting it together. It just, the game feels good. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I I think so too. I think he's just really nailed the theme of it. Like, and it's, it's, and and the just how narrative it is, I think, is is something that's really ex- exciting. At least if you're, mm-hmm. you know, the kind of gamer that I am, where that sort of thing excites you and gets the creativity going. Totally. Um, and it kind of, I think it sets it apart from other things that are out there too. Agreed. So, like it, the, there are the games that sort of have that element, but it's just pushed it that much further. Hmm. But without you know dipping too far into RPG territory. Yeah, yeah. It it definitely is still a tabletop skirmish game. It just yeah. It you're right. It it's not a role playing game. It definitely isn't. But it isn't right. a traditional skirmish game either. It is. It's its own animal. It's a hybrid. It's great. Um, I hope we see more games like this because it just there's just so much opportunity to do cool things with it on the tabletop. Um, I think Joe's really hit it out of the park. I think there's a lot of, uh, I think he need, it needs a giant pat on the bat for this because, uh, clearly it's been a labor of love and, uh, he put a lot of work and it's great. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, I think it's, it seems to be sort of getting some, some, some buzz, which is awesome because it's a great game. Mm. Um, and I think when sort of cyberpunk 20, what is it? What's the game? 2077? 2077. I think when that sort of drops next year, I think people might sort of flock Mm -hmm. to it, much like sort of they did with Fallout and this is not a test and that's sort of fed into that. Um, And and people should. Uh, Have you seen the miniatures that are coming out for the new version of the the role-playing game? No. Uh, I can't remember the name of the company, but there are miniatures coming out based on that game and they look incredible Ooh, another and, and that, another set of miniatures i need to buy Ooh, and they'll they'll be they'll be perfect for this game oh, yeah. my wallet's screaming already yep, yep. <laughs> well uh i have my uh, my dog jumping up on my knee which is uh usually a sign that he needs to go out for walkies and i think that might uh that might be the end. Um, Scott, thank you so much for coming on to Talk Shop tonight, man. It's um, I'm desperate to play this, and I hope to play Reality's Edge with you soon. But uh, thank you for coming on to talk about your hobby and talk about what you like about the game. Um, any parting thoughts? Uh, no, nothing else. Uh, uh, I suppose if you're in Melbourne, uh, in the north, or even if you don't mind traveling, check out uh, Axes Nails Gaming Club, mm-hmm. which meets every Thursday night on... Uh, at 
Tallboy and Moose, which is a brew pub in Preston. Mm-hmm. And we sort of take over the whole back of the brewery mm-hmm. uh, and have a bunch of tables and it's really fun. That's where I've been playing uh, Reality's Edge. And um, you, let's, let's talk about that because... So this is a club that the terrain is largely provided by Knights of Dice. Now, if you are not familiar with Knights of Dice, um, that is K-N-I-G-H-T, Knight as in a knight in shining armor, um, search them up because their products are truly astonishing. Is the best tabletop terrain possibly there is um, in the modern world. And that's saying something. They are my favorites by far. And I absolutely love the stuff that these guys do. I own a ton of it. It's durable. It's it's easy to put together. Um, and it just looks, it's top tier. It is phenomenal. And this is a club where almost all of the terrain is Knights of Dice. And so it's just awesome. Um, every time I look at pictures, I am just blown away of the games that you, because you guys have a million different games happening every week. And uh, check out the um, Axes and Ales uh, Facebook page if you haven't already. Um, if you are in Melbourne, definitely get over there, guys. Uh, I'm hoping to check it out on this school holiday because, yeah, got to get in, got to gotta hang out and play some games. We guys is just, it looks too good, man, too good. You guys are doing great work over there. Uh, thanks so much, Brad. It's uh, that's really kind of you to say. Um, and yeah, it's 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 in a brewery, and they have great beer and they have great food, and uh, yeah, it's a really nice uh, environment to play games in. Totally, man. Yeah, right on. Well, Scott, thank you so much for coming on, man. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. Anytime. And guys, you at home, thank you very much for listening. Um, this, yeah. I'm super excited about this game and you know it's sometimes weird to have people on to talk about games that I'm really excited about and I haven't had a chance to uh, necessarily get on the table myself but uh, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and uh, I hope you will check out Knights of Dice um, stuff online please check out their website it is definitely worth the visit um, and while you're online please go to Facebook and search up Cast Dice C-A-S-T-D-I-C-E if you have not already and uh, please like the page. It's my personal hobby blog. Um, but I will be doing more um, interactive uh, polls um, with uh, people who like the page. Um, it is also where if you would like to leave feedback for this show or other shows like it, um, like the Warlord cast that I also do, please message that page and let me know. Um, Though I'm always talking to different people every week, this show is largely me. Um, and so sometimes podcasting uh, can be a, uh, a solo endeavor. And it's, got, it's nice to get feedback from folks to hear what they do like, what they don't like, and how I can make the show better. And of course, um, a lot of the polls about what we will have in coming weeks will be directly tied to the hard launch of the Cast Dice YouTube page, which is coming in the next couple of weeks. Um, Technology is scary. I'm working my way through it. Um, all the equipment is now purchased in here. And yeah, I thought learning audio was bad. But we'll get there. Anyway, perseverance. Positive mindset. Um, <laughs> on that note, when you are playing the games that uh, we know and love, I hope your dice roll hot. I hope your beverages are cold. But more than that, I hope y'all are having fun. This is Cast Dice saying goodnight.